there's a number I'll share with you now that it's kind of telling about, first of all, how U.S. multinationals think, and it tells them what they think about Ireland. But in, in the last five years, 2008, 2012, U.S. companies invested more capital in Ireland, foreign direct investment, than they had done in the previous 50 years, 50 years and then some. And so a lot has changed since the crisis about how multinationals, U.S. multinationals view the world. Uh, in terms of their global supply chains, concentrating where they invest that extra dollar uh, overseas. Ireland is very much in the forefront uh, of the minds of U.S. multinationals for lots of reasons, and not just corporate, you know, lower corporate tax rates. There's other reasons for that, and every day when I talk uh, with a lot of folks back in, in New York, it's about, well, it's all about corporate tax rates, lower. It, it's not. Multinationals in the United States to be successful have to leverage skilled labor. They need access to markets. They need wealthy consumers. They need a transparency, a rule of laws. They need the ease of doing business. They need to be places where they're competitive. And at the end of the day, that leads a lot of U.S. companies to Ireland and the EU in general, the European Union is still the primary source where U.S. companies invest their capital. Whether it's in historic cost basis or annual flows, the EU is still taking around 50, 55 percent of the global total. And that's counterintuitive to the narrative out there that says U.S. companies are leaving the U.S. to go to China, India, Mexico, or any place that offers a low-cost competitive advantage. In some cases, that's true. But they're the minority, not the exception. And really, for, for the last 50 years, US, U.S. companies have always had their eye on the European Union because they want the large, wealthy markets to tap into it. We need it. The U.S. economy is growing around 2.5% right now. Um, we've got an aging demographic population to deal with. We have uh, saturated markets, but we need the big overlay of the European Union. And that's where <clears throat> Ireland comes in as a great bridge to the big EU market. And as I remind people on Wall Street many times, um, you know, why Europe? That was the big question. You know, why Europe? You know, who cares about Europe? That kind of that's the mentality. Well, I remind them that when collectively the 28 countries of the European Union is the largest economic entity in the world. It's larger than the United States. It's wealthy, more people. And that kind of dwarfs China in India. And I'll talk about uh, those folks here in a moment. But the European Union, I guess the good news, and hopefully it's true, that they're, they're, you're coming out of the recession. It's going to be spotty. It's not going to be tremendously robust. But in the last two years, I've sat on Wall Street and listened to one U.S. company after another, GE, IBM, Cisco, and so forth, say we had pretty good earnings for, for this quarter, but Europe is still a drag. You know, Europe is still hurting us, whether because of the recession. I think that's behind us now. I think some, a lot of these U.S. companies are going to talk about how Europe is improving, less bad, it's even better, better than expected. And that's going to be hugely successful if and when we do get down to that, you know, the 11th hour with the free trade agreement. And I'll talk about TTIP uh, in a moment. So I'm encouraged that the European Union, A, is, is growing, and B, I never bought the nonsense two years ago that the Eurozone was going to break apart, that the Euro was going to go by the wayside. Um, I don't believe the U.K. is going to lead the, the EU. There was, but, you know, it's kind of easy to say that now, but I remember getting a lot of pushback uh, in New York amongst investors and with a lot of big institutional money managers betting against the Euro, betting against Greece, the periphery, Ireland included, saying, like, they can't pull it off. It's not, they're not going to hold it together. And I think that's behind us, and I think that's, that's a positive uh, variable by which we should all be happy for. I'd also say a positive uh, indicator is that the U.S. economy, um, despite the shenanigans in Washington, um, the U.S. economy has found its footing. We're re rebuilding. We're resilient. Many metrics in the U.S. are now higher today than they were prior to the crisis, right? So we were at pre-crisis highs, record highs in some cases, when it comes to automobile production, uh, housing starts, net household net worth, GDP, uh, and so forth. So Europe has a strong partner in the United States. And in fact, the United States has been doing its part to help Europe come through the recession and the crisis by running a $100 billion trade deficit with the EU for the last couple of years. It's going to be even higher uh, this year. It'll start to tail off. So, but that's the part and parcel of a dynamic relationship in the sense when one partner is down, the other one kind of hopefully grows and kind of can be offsetting variable. And with the U.S. and Europe, and it, it's not appreciated, and it, it is here, but I, not, not in the United States, I'll just be honest with and blunt with you, um, they don't appreciate how big the transatlantic economy is. They don't appreciate what European companies are doing in America, i.e. creating output, creating jobs, 
pro providing good wages, tax revenues, exports for, for the U.S. And conversely, um, there isn't a general awareness that when U.S. companies do invest overseas, it's here in Ireland, in the EU, as opposed to these low-cost areas, China and India and so forth. So for me, the broad, painting with a broad brush, even, even we are, here we, here we are 2013, we're well into this century, right? We're, we're, moving, we're, we're going deeper into the second decade of the century. And still, I keep waiting for the numbers to change. I keep waiting for U.S. companies to really go heavy into Africa or China and India. But no, when you aggregate the numbers quarter by quarter, you see some shifts. There's a shift of U.S. investment within the EU, but I think Ireland is winning that war, so to speak. I see mo less money going into France, for instance, less out of Belgium. I think Spain and Italy could see a little bit more here if they lower their costs and do what Ireland has, has done with the internal adjustments. Germany is still a focal point because of the capital machinery and the R&D uh, complex. Switzerland, I think, is becoming uncompetitive, and they're going to start to see less money flow from the United States. So within Europe, U.S. multinationals are reconfiguring, rethinking how they do business in, within the EU and how they approach it. And it's clearly, there's three countries that stand out. It's the Netherlands, the U.K., and Ireland are becoming the focal point more and more of concentrating how U.S. and where U.S. companies do business uh, in the European Union. So Ireland has a very good kind of setup for that. Another statistic that we put in a report uh, this morning was that of all the countries by which U.S. multinationals leverage uh, these countries to access larger, deeper markets, like use as an export platform, right? A lot of U.S. companies, they, they're in Mexico and they send the product back to the U.S. Canada, the same thing. China, not so much, but the media thinks we just over there in China to kind of sell back to the U.S. It's not true. Ninety percent of what foreign affiliates make in China stays in China. But the number one export platform for U.S. companies today is Ireland. Right, it's, and which is very dynamic. There's a there's a table in there that you know, Ireland was ranked 13th in terms of scale, uh, but now they're number one. So Ireland has become the number one export platform for U.S. companies to reach deeper into the EU. And so when we talk about TTIP, the transatlantic you know partnership, that I think you know I'll be honest with you, I the odds of this happening, my, my opinion, not John Hopkins or Bank of America or, or anything, um, I, I would say one in three successful. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, I'm, trade, I'm kind of jaded by trade negotiations because they always seem to go on forever and they never, they never finished. Um, Doha, for instance. Doha is the first multilateral round that's failed uh, in the post-war era. TTIP, tremendous amount of opportunity. Um, it, it's going to be a tough sell on both sides of the ocean. In the United States, the good news is no one's paying attention to it or really you know, kind of focused on it. Um, and we got too many other issues like keeping the government open. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But TTIP, you know, I, I said this in Brussels earlier this year. It's, it's, you know, the good news is that we, need, we both need to be growing. We both need to have the unemployment rate coming down. We both need to have our politicians and our, the, the general public aware of the benefits. And that's uh, kind of my, my mission for quite some time is to kind of spread the word about the benefits of this relationship with the big EU partners and, and vice versa, why it's beneficial for U.S. companies or U.S. consumers to have big U.S. Cor Irish corporations or European corporations operating in the United States. So TTIP, more about not so much lowering as, you know, the, 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 the tariffs, but the non-tariff barriers. This gets very technical uh, in this sense, you know, whether it's packaging, uh, rules and regulations around health, uh, life sciences, food, automobiles, um, this is really in, in the weeds, and to me, the big winners will be corporations, um, and hopefully that will trickle down to consumers. You know, if, if corporations are lowering their costs, increasing their efficiencies, reaping, reaching deeper into each other's markets, that should help earnings drive more hiring, more investment, hopefully in each, in each other's markets. That's the game plan. But I think it's going to be a tough sell. I mean, trade negotiations in, in general are going to be a tough sell, particularly in the United States. We were just talking about this a moment ago. President Obama has not even asked for trade promotion authority yet, right? He needs that because if it goes to Congress, who knows what's going to come out? Maybe nothing. Well, nothing comes out of Congress. Not much comes out of Congress anyways uh, on a good day, let alone uh, on a day, you know, day to day. So, and it's a tough sell. I mean, the, I'll tell you, you know, the Americans, we still have an unemployment rate that's unacceptably high. It's 7.3%. It's, that's, that's, that's new territory for the United States to deal with. So, it, quote, unquote, it's, it's, it's high. 
Um, we're going to have a window here. It's going to be the end of 2014 because once we get into 15 and 16, all bets are off. And there's not much happening on Capitol Hill, particularly a major trade piece of legislation. Uh, maybe the good news, playing, playing devil's advocate, we're running two parallel tracks here in the United States. One is the agreement with uh, Europe and the other agreements, trade agreements with Asia. Maybe we forego Asia for Europe or maybe vice versa. We'll see how it plays out. And then even here in Ireland and in European Union, you know, to do a deal with the United States that opens up markets and creates uh, potential more competition, the threat of lost jobs, that's going to be a tough sell as well. Particularly, you mean the unemployment rates across Europe are staggering are staggering, relatively speaking, particularly amongst younger workers. So TTIP, I'm, I'm excited about it, but cautious, cautiously optimistic that this can g gain the traction and by which we can sell it to um, our constituents. I think the, the biggest risk out there is not in the ne negotiations and the, and the technical details in and of itself. It's just there's, there's just not a general awareness of how important the bilateral relationship is. Um, I've been at this for, I think, 15, 20 years now, talking about the transatlantic economy. And I'm still amazed about how the pushback I get, uh, particularly in the United States, saying, like, Joe, it's not about Europe. Who, who cares about Europe, quote, unquote? It's about China and India and so forth. And I'll just kind of end by talking about China, India, and the BRICS. And I can just tell you, you know, honestly, in my opinion, and I've said this over and over, they're not grown up. They're not ready to lead the global economy. They're not about global governance. They're not about you know, caring about your, your constituents, my constituents. They see the world differently. If you're in China and India, you've got about a billion people you've got to think about first before you worry about, well, how are we going to cut a deal at Global Commons uh, with the United States or Europe? So to me, if we've learned anything in the last 12 months, is that the developing economies are not up to the task of running the, the world, let alone leading it, right? Their growth has slowed down dramatically. China's growth is really 6-7%. Brazil's growth is less than Ireland's, probably, or you know, kind of equivalent to it. They're in recession. India, 4 or 5% growth, if you believe the numbers, which I don't. In general, though, the emerging markets are having a tough year. That's what we, that's what, that should concern everyone in this room, because we don't want them to fail. We want them to succeed, to be global partners uh, in that sense. And they're not living up to the hype and the expectations, right? And they're 50% of world GDP now, right, on a purchasing power parity basis. The develop is 50%, the developing is 50-51, you know, it's moving in this direction. That's all well and good, but you've got this 50% that really doesn't know anything about looking at the big, broader world and doing things for the better of mankind as opposed to their own self-interest. And that's what the U.S. and European relationship has been all about, really, for the last 60 years. It's about not making you know, each other better, but the world better. And so that's why I think TTIP is so important. This is a huge step forward to deepen relationship between two mature partners, give some more vitality to it, bring some energy to it. And, you know, I remember when I was in, in March over in Brussels, um, the TTIP was like a hot topic because the president had just announced it in the State of the Union. And there was a lot of energy in the room in Brussels. I mean, that's the most energy I've ever seen out of Brussels. Um, <laughs> it kind of felt, felt nice. But at the same time, I was a little worried, like, you're going to burn out, you're going to get fatigued because it's not going to happen. I mean, I don't want to you know, be the kind of the skunk at the garden party, but um, I like the energy level, and it kind of speaks to the value of yet, yet what you could yet to come. So we not only need TTIP for the United States and Europe to continue on the path of growth and better the lives of our, each other's uh, population, but it's going to be a bullish case for the global economy, right? It's hugely important that we shine the light for Africa, the Middle East, parts of the Indian subcontinent, and even China for that matter, to say here's how the standards are going to be set. Here's the rules of the game. Um, be, if you want to be a part of this big, huge economic block called the transatlantic economy, here's how, you do, here's how we do business. Here's how we treat in intellectual property rights. Here's how we report uh, accounting, uh, t rules of law, and so forth. So this is, a, to me, I, I don't want to be too negative. I'll end by saying, you know, is it TTIP? It could be the last chance. Could be the last chance for the United States and Europe to significantly control the future of the global economy. And I, when I say the future, I mean the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. If we can make this happen, we kind of set the rules, lay out the playing field for the rest of the mankind to play by. And I don't think we're going to tilt the, you know, the playing field against them, albeit many think that. But to me, it's a huge opportunity for, for United States and Europe to show the world that we still matter. They know that, but let's remind them starkly and make the world a better place uh, in the meantime. Thank you.